The NAP Connection features a panel from the Lehigh Valley and the Brooks area discussing selected art issues and procedures with a knowledgeable guest. The program moderator is James Carroll. During the live panel discussion, the home viewer has the opportunity to call the station and offer their views and concerns for inclusion in the discussion. The NAP Connection is brought to you by the New Arts Program, a nonprofit arts service organization in cooperation with the Berks Community Television. The NAP Connection is supported in part by the Pennsylvania Council on the Arts, local government, area businesses, NAP memberships, and individual contributions. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you. And uh, tonight we have a treat. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, Pearl Buck. We're going to be talking about China. Uh, we're going to be talking in today's terms, which uh, might be interesting because we have a tendency to uh, have limited understanding and usually deal with what we believe and agree with. Uh, so what we're going to try to do is enlighten you with some understanding. With us tonight, we have, I have three guests, and uh, we have uh, uh, Janet Roberts, who is going to tell you about the topic that we have tonight, and also is going to introduce our two guests that we have. And uh, I think I, in, in the topic that we have, uh, I've sort of put it in my own terms, and Janet will also enlighten you on this even more. I call it cultural currencies in biographies. Um, which uh, in some ways I feel that it covers uh, the ramification of the idea of people and ideas and uh, the enrichment that it has to do with more than one. With us, uh, Janet is a lecturer in Chinese and Japanese art and culture for the University of Penn Museum of Archaeology and Anthropology in Philadelphia. This I didn't know. I'm, I, I find that very interesting. Uh, she has participated in exchanges uh, in Shanghai, and she has also uh, been awarded fellowships in residency at the Virginia Center for the Arts. And she is a poet and uh, uh, she, hopefully, she will tell us about some of uh, her publications uh, before we get through. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to you, Janet, and thank you for coming. Thank you, James, for inviting us. This evening we're going to focus on China <coughs> and the opportunity to look at a cultural biography, which the proposal to uh, James to look at currency our theme will be how much currency um, value is there in translation of one culture into another culture. And is the author a mediator of that culture, um, particularly if it's an author who has spent most of her um, developing years in China, as did Pearl Buck, um, as did Nady Dating Gordimer, um, and other, other authors who have been expats in other countries. We have with us this evening Peter Kahn, who is graduate chair at the University of Pennsylvania, and in his capacity here, author of his new book. Peter, would you like to show, <coughs> the, show the camera on us? Show, show the book. <laughs> Your book, A Cultural Biography, Pearl S. Buck, which is published by Cambridge University Press, and will be out when, Peter? July, August. In July or August. So we have an advanced copy from the publishers here. It focuses on the biographical material connected with the Pearl Buck uh, having been in China, and it focuses on the books and the production of literature which she created in this country, its reception in China and its reception here. In that turn, I will also uh, point out a recent meeting uh, with a lovely lady <coughs> who is in the reverse position and show her book as well, which she'll much appreciate, Betty Bell Lord who is the uh, wife of Winston Lord, who is our assistant 
uh, Secretary of State and was the ambassador in China when I was in China. I went for a 10-minute interview with her um, at the residency uh, in Beijing and stayed for two hours. Um, she was very eager to talk about her book, which she had to put on hold because as the ambassador's wife, um, it didn't permit her the kind of time that she needed in order to finish her book. It's taken her 12 years and she's finally brought it out and it's called <coughs> The Middle Heart. And she's just been on tour with it uh, in America. And the back side shows a portrait of her. And it is a, a, a biography of three uh, Chinese who are from all different strata in the Chinese um, society. And their pledge, if you will, in American terms, like blood brothers, uh, the white and the Native American Indian used to cut blood and, and become brother and brother or brother and sister. And these three make that pledge that no matter what happens to them historically, um, they will remain together. I am about halfway through it, and it's a beautiful book. Um, her first book was Spring Moon. And this is the story of a, a Chinese woman um, who lived in China until she was about age 10 and came here, grew up in California, um, was educated here and in Hawaii um, at Tufts and at <coughs> the University of Hawaii, met her husband Winston Lord, who whisked her back to the Orient, um, where he had a career as a diplomat. And her reception in China was difficult for her because she was speaking about a Chinese life when she had not lived in China. And I think we might bear that in mind when we speak about Pearl Buck tonight, where we're speaking about an American who did not grow up in America, but came back to tell Americans about what it was like to be Chinese. We also have with us, and, and I guess credentials, <laughs> it almost seems beside the point with Peter at this point, but I guess Yale, PhD Yale? Indeed. Indeed. Yeah. Which is not beside the point, <laughs> really, is it? <laughs> and undergraduate? Uh, a little Catholic college called Providence College in Providence, Rhode Island. And you came to be interested in Pearl S. Buck because of the adoption of your child, or um, it, it the, multifaceted, really, in the way you the think about? The biography that I eventually wrote of Pearl Buck began about 20 years ago when my wife and I adopted a child through an agency called Welcome House, which was founded by Pearl Buck nearly 50 years ago as the world's first international interracial adoption agency. Um, I won't talk more about that unless you want me to. The founding of Welcome House is itself interesting and revealing about Pearl Buck, but it seems to me you're still getting going, so I won't launch into that right here and right now. Well, it's a good point to introduce <laughs> our other guest, who is the new executive director of the Pearl S. Buck Foundation, mm -hmm. Meredith Richardson, mm -hmm. an Australian. She tried to persuade oh, us over dinner that she could tell us she was perhaps from Ro Providence, Rhode Island. <laughs> um, but I, I think her Australian accent is very welcome. And being in um, the Pacific Rim, coming from the Pacific Rim and being a, a Caucasian, it certainly has given you a background in association with the Asian Pacific Rim. Mm -hmm. That and being an expert in, in this society, too. Yes. Is another link. Yes. Another, another linkage. Um, so tell us a little bit about your 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 tenure so far with the Pearl Buck Foundation. You've just come on board. Precise, uh, three months, yes. <laughs> <laughs> she has a 12-year-old daughter. Yes, and uh, currently still living in Washington, and, I, and I'm commuting at the moment, but we're going to move into the Bucks County uh, area uh, in June. And I understand that you had your first contact with China through the China Friendship Association with Australia? You remember things, don't you? Yes, a long time ago. Yes, Actually, I was when I was at university and at secondary school, uh, China was one of the areas that, uh, the fields that I studied. Um, and had always wanted to go to China and got to be a member of an organization that was called the Australian China Friendship Society and eventually had my first trip to China in 1975. Yes. I remember because the China, U.S.-China People's Friendship Association made possible my year in China. Uh -huh. It started uh, when I went to hear a postdoc at uh, Princeton talk as she was the fellowship recipient for the American Association of University Women. She spoke about the poet, who was the poet who lived in the garden which was being installed at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. So it was a rather complex task and she showed slides about that garden being transported and installed in the Metropolitan and uh, she showed this poet's life and I told her I would really like to go to China and she said well you can. 
And that's how it started. She insisted that it was possible. And uh, the U.S.-China People's Friendship Association uh, made that exchange possible. So that's why I remember it. Um, you also were a field director for Plan International, which is London-based. Uh -huh. Can you tell yes. us a little bit about what Plan International is? Um, it's one of the very large uh, non-profit organizations in the world, rather similar to the Pearl S. Buck Foundation, uh, in that it tries to provide care and services to children mm -hmm. throughout the world who are in some way marginalized or displaced or, or not in the mainstream of their society, economically, socially, and all sorts of other ways. With the Pearl S. Buck Foundation in the past, the focus has been on Amerasian children. Um, though more recently the programs have moved to other parts of the globe. But um, Pearl S. Buck founded the organization herself to try and uh, provide assistance to these children who were the products of these, these two cultures, um, but not really part of either of those cultures and not owned or taken care of by the cultures uh, that they uh, really belong to. There's great consciousness um, in America, particularly about uh, the orphans in Romania. Uh -huh. Can you define a little more, uh, with more definition for our audience, what the difference is between being an abandoned child or um, a street child in India as opposed to being um, a displaced child? Um, I don't think there's a terrible great difference. I think displaced probably is a term. We, we try not use the words uh, such as abandoned or rejected because, or unwanted because mm -hmm. usually somebody uh, somewhere has wanted these children or somebody does love them. Mm -hmm. um, they just don't come with the full complement of the family support and the social support that we take for granted in, okay. in, in normal middle class sort of society. Yeah, I was also intrigued <coughs> to see that you consulted with the World Wildlife Fund and the Immigration and, and Refugee Services in America. I yes, worked for some time with lots of different types of organizations that work internationally and um, are looking at issues of both development, which mm -hmm. is what we talk about when we're talking about uh, sectors of societies that don't participate in the full socioeconomic uh, benefits that the rest of their society participates in, or when we look at societies where the environment um, is, is not taken care of. And so in other words, these are all lost. interdependent and interrelated to one another. Yeah, definitely, yes. And, <clears throat> and also a clarification for our audience, when we speak about the Pearl S. Buck Foundation, that is going to become clear as it's our focus for this evening. But how does it relate to Save the Children and UNICEF and, and these other organizations which focus on children? Well, they're all, they're all organizations that have a mission of taking care of children who are outside the mainstream or, or families and, and communities that are outside the mainstream. The Pearl S. Buck Foundation is special in that it celebrates and is a legacy uh, of Pearl S. Buck herself. Yes. And uh, it was established by um, this rather amazing lady who um, had experienced and could um, describe um, incredibly well uh, cultures that were different from the one that, that supposedly she, that she had actually been born into. Um, and she founded uh, the foundation. Yes, foundations are founded, aren't they? Um, to um, uh, provide uh, care and, and, and resources to these these children who were were um, outside the mainstream as we talk about it and in a way it's a living legacy of everything that she stood for in her life and, and everything that's celebrated in her writing and, and that Peter uh, captures so well in, in his uh, biography of her. Yes. Um, I, I could go on forever, but I don't know no, if you want we'll me to. No, <laughs> <laughs> we'll stop. Isn't, I'm, I'm that, isn't the organization uh, the only organization that has her name on it? All the other, yeah. I mean, yes. Yes. Do you want to pick up on that one, Well, I mean, she, she, said she, uh, she founded uh, the Pearl S. Buck Foundation in 1964. Uh, she was at that time 70 years old and uh, was still quite active, still looking for ways to be helpful, especially to children, displaced, disadvantaged uh, children. And she said it was the only organization she wanted with her name on it. Uh, and 30 plus years later, there it still is. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Peter spoke earlier of, of, of Welcome House, yeah. which was the other institution that she'd established uh, much earlier, um, which actually still exists as part of the foundation. Uh, in addition to the, the, the part of the organization that works in country, 
uh, and in community with children, uh, Welcome House is still an international adoption agency, mm -hmm. placing children from China and all parts of the globe, including Romania, that you mentioned earlier, uh, with families here in America. Mm -hmm. Well, we'll come back and, and talk about this more. Um, I think that we would like to meet Pearl Buck before we continue. And we have a short clip in which we'll look a little bit at some of the people who want to comment about her life in addition to our panel here this evening and shows her uh, as well. was only three months old. I spoke Chinese before I spoke English. I came to know the Chinese people as my own people. My parents did not live in the big cities in Zhejiang and Jiangsu, in Jiangxi and Hunan, in Anhui and Sandong. But best of all, I love the Chinese farming country and the villages. mother were both married to professors at the University of Nanking. The two women were, I suppose, the most literate and articulate of the Nanking missionary community, uh, at least more sophisticated and cosmopolitan, and they had had good educations in this country. They were, both of them, deeply interested in literature and writing fiction. So Mother and Pearl would meet and show each other their work uh, read it to each other, comment, critique it, and they, they bonded. These were formative years for Pearl Buck, but little did Pearl and her Nan King neighbors realize that events and history were soon to bear down on their insulated little world. You see, the whole country was in turmoil, and some of the Nan King people felt that it would be like some of the other disturbances we'd had and wouldn't amount to anything. Although Pearl Buck's devotion to writing preceded the Nanking incident, her close brush with death seems to have intensified her literary drive. The Nanking uh, experience left, of course, a, a great gash, so to speak, in her personal history, to which she referred many times. For example, it was a personal experience that projected into Imperial Woman, the story of the last Empress of China, her knowledge of how these Chinese revolutions occurred and how violent they were and how bloody. She said the good earth was regarded in the West as vulgar and she said the Chinese would never regard it as vulgar because they're naturalistic. And I think she came back from China imbued with the naturalism of the Chinese, an acceptance of realities, an acceptance of the cycles of life, a sort of inability to be shocked. For its time, it was a very uh, important book, if not so much in redefining the function of the novel in, Eng in American literature, as in opening up a new content dimension. And I think her major contribution is therefore uh, on the cutting edge of the new internationalism. Expected an extraordinary odyssey that was to come. Hello, NBC. Hello, NBC. This is Stockholm, Sweden speaking. I think I have rather good piece of news for you. A while ago, the message reached us that the Swedish Academy has decided to award the Nobel Prize for Literature for 1938 to Pearl Seidenstrecker Buck. The prize this year goes to Pearl Buck. It goes to somebody who is well known in Sweden. Nearly all her books have been translated to Swedish. East Wind, West Wind in 1933, 
the good earth in 1935, and further the young revolutionists, sons, a house divided, the exile, fighting angel, and the mother. The good earth has been a bestseller in Sweden, like in so many other countries, and has been praised highly by the critics and by the public. Uh, the critics were right. She is not now uh, listed with uh, O'Neill and T.S. Eliot and Henry James, uh, but I and people like me were also right. She is still read all over the world. Explained the association. She said, this is a symbol for East and this is a symbol for West, and you put them together and they mean good in China. I, this, I don't know whether this is completely accurate linguistically, but I, I like the idea. And she, she meant that this was to bring East and West together, and she felt that the peace of the world in the future would depend on the extent that the East and the West could understand each other. So certainly we are one world, and, and if we don't know it, it's dangerous, but I think we are beginning to know it more and more. And that does not mean that we give up our nationhood. Oh, but did. Pearlbuck understood the complexities of the East, particularly the harsh realities facing children of mixed races within Asia. I think most of the Chinese uh, young people find that Pearlbuck's novels are really a kind of a treasure, a very precious record of what Chinese were like in, back in the uh, early 20th century. Well, we'll see. So there we are. We've got Pearl Buck with us again. Now, over dinner, James was telling us that he had met uh, Karma Hinton, who is a filmmaker who has released a film. Do I have it correct, Peter? The Gate of Heavenly Peace. The Gate of Heavenly Peace. The Gate of Heavenly Peace, which was shown here in Philadelphia, and I had the pleasure of having lunch at the White Dog Cafe um, with her and her husband, Richard Gordon. Richard Gordon and having a conversation with them and the audience about the film. And then we went to, to see the film. And that film is being viewed at the Asia Society in New York, I believe, in May. And it is an extraordinary effort to document uh, the sequence of events that led up to Tiananmen, but over uh, several decades preceding in order to show it in perspective and to somehow lend uh, some insight into the aftermath and the prelude to it. Her father, um, Carmen Hinton's father, uh, spent time in China in a village, uh, in an agricultural village in China. And Carmen Hinton had the experience of growing up in China. And James told us over dinner that he has met uh, Mr. Hinton, who lives in this area, uh, and perhaps would like to share a few. Well, he lives in Fleetwood. Thoughts about him? Uh, which is only about 14 miles uh, north of Reading. Uh, Bill was, uh, I believe, worked for UNICEF back in 49. He went to China to uh, help with farming. And uh, he got caught up in the uh, cultural activities of China and uh, he wrote his book, which became a classic. Uh, Long, dealing Longbow Village, right? Uh, yes, and it, but it's called Fanchen. Fanchen, to turn over, to right. turn over regurgitate. Uh, could be another term for it, I guess. <laughs> to turn over. <laughs> turn over is better, I think. Uh, sounds like it's <laughs> down. Uh, the, uh, but it was until 53 that I think that he came back, so he spent uh, about uh, four years, almost four years being there, which can be quite incredible because it was at the very beginning. And, and his wife today is, is still continuing the efforts with UNICEF? Uh, no, no, his, uh, he wife. had a wife here in, in the States and uh, Joanne died of a brain tumor and uh, Bill has a new wife who uh, works for UNICEF and uh, they live in, uh, she's in Outer Mongolia now, and um, Bill is uh, living in Peking. Um, his son is also uh, studying to be a uh, uh, acupuncture, and he'll be coming back to this country uh, sometime this year uh, to practice, which uh, 
will be quite interesting. Carmen Hinton is at Harvard and she's pursuing a degree in art history, uh, Chinese art history, <clears throat> as she has such a profound knowledge of, of China and of the language itself. And her husband and she have set up um, a company which is based in Cambridge, which continues uh, developing interest and in publications uh, and films about China. Her mother, uh, Bill's mother, is also named Carmen. And she was the one who set up the, uh, 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 trying to think of the school up in Vermont. Uh, um, can't think of it now, but it's well known. <coughs> the School for Exchanges of High School Internet. students? Excuse me? I think you mean Bennington? No, no. It's a, a, boor a boarding school uh, that's quite well known as far as uh, education is concerned. Uh, yes, it was quite quite interesting. Well, Karma is an example of an American who grew up in China because her father was based there with UNICEF. Um, many of the people have written about China or have done productions uh, about their experience in living in China have been missionaries, uh, sons or daughters. Some of the novelists such as John Hersey, right Peter? Right. And what was his experience in terms of did he did he grow up in China or Hersey Hersey was he was a child in China he was the child not of um, ordained missionaries but of YMCA missionaries mm -hmm. and uh, Hersey who knew Pearl Buck when Pearl Buck was an older woman and Hersey was middle aged um, and with whom I spoke about Pearl Buck when I was doing the book uh, Hersey wrote one of the great China missionary novels a book called The Coal back in 1985 at an unjustly neglected book, but a, but a great book about the China missionary experience. We heard from James Michener. Now James Michener was uh, a somewhat of an abandoned child himself, wasn't well, he, in his youth? He also, we, we saw James Michener on the tape, although he wasn't identified, so I'm not quite sure how many people in the audience recognized him, but he was the feisty elderly man who was saying, uh, the, 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 the piece of film from which that comes, the longer piece of film, is one in which Michener, who was a uh, close friend of Pearl Buck's for quite a few years and worked with her closely on projects like Welcome House, mm -hmm. uh, Michener is arguing that uh, yes, it's true that Pearl Buck as a writer uh, is not a T.S. Eliot or a William Faulkner, but around the world millions of people are still reading Pearl Buck's uh, novels and stories. Uh, both in English and in translation. How many languages? Is uh, it's hard to say, but yeah, languages? yeah, it's uh, it's seventy or eighty languages. The United Nations did a survey in 1970, which is not that many years ago. The result of which was that Pearl Buck was the most frequently translated American writer of the 20th century, mm -hmm. more than Steinbeck, more than uh, Hemingway, and so on. So whether that remains true now, I'm not sure. But she's been translated into dozens and dozens of languages over the years: uh, European, Asian, African. And James Michener himself is an author of many books which require research in, in different parts of the right. world. Um, the one closest to Asia would be probably Hawaii. Hawaii, yeah. And he has set up, uh, endowed, a wonderful art museum which is very close to the Pearl Buck uh, right. Foundation right. and her home. And which just opened the Pearl Buck Room uh, as one of its most I recent. I didn't even know that. Yes, Good. just just opening right now, right. yes. Yeah. Which, and what are the contents of that room? What, how is it? I don't know. I haven't seen it yet. <laughs> <laughs> I had a meeting recently with the with the director of the museum, and we were talking about it. Yes. Um, and it's op it's just opened. Um, but I, in the three and a half months I've been around, I haven't had time yet. Uh, but it's on it's on the list of what we're going to do very soon. It's One developing an uh, internationalism with the Nakashima room, and now the Burles <laughs> Buck room, as well as the James uh, Michener study. It's hard for me to start telling stories about Pearl Buck and Michener because having spent four years writing this book, I'm always afraid that I'll start talking in the middle of a story and people won't understand the context. But let me see if I can tell you one Michener Pearl Buck story briefly. Um, Michener was a younger admirer of Pearl Buck's and would become her close friend just after the Second World War when Michener was the young and spectacularly suddenly famous author of Tales of the South Pacific. He was asked, Michener was asked by Harry Luce, the famous publisher of Time Mag, Time Life, to write a story on the new post-war American writers, uh, especially the young men that had come out of the war, Jimmy Jones and Norman Mailer and so on. Michener wrote this article for Harry Luce and in it included a paragraph on Pearl Buck. 